All right, I'm gonna go. Okay, people starting to join. Brilliant. Hopefully everyone can hear us coming through. So welcome to this webinar. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, we've got a really exciting half an hour uh, ahead of us. So I'm going to dive straight into it. My name's uh, Matthew or Tepi McLaughlin, uh, and I'm helping moderate today. And we've got also uh, Dr. Rachel Sutherland here to help moderate. So any of your questions that will come through on today's webinar, we'll be looking after. Um, but let me dive straight in and introduce our speaker. So today we've got uh, Dr. Joe Piggin. Uh, Joe is a senior lecturer at Loughborough University and his interests are in physical activity policy and politics. He's also asked me to share that he is from New Zealand and that he won't be winning the World Cup rugby hey. this year. <laughs> oh, my heart is broken. <laughs> Um, you may have seen some uh, changes at ISPAR recently. Um, so this is a joint webinar between ISPAR and ISBNPAR, but we're trying to shake up the webinar format. Um, we've had many people engage with this one, which is fantastic. So firstly, we're going to start using the Q&A feature of Zoom. So you'll be able to access that from the Zoom control bar, which you'll find either at the top or the bottom of your screen. We're also going to be running some polls, and that gives me my first prompt to run the first poll. So, what's everyone's main role? I'll keep it open for a few minutes. And I can see that we've got uh, almost 50 people on so far, which is great. So, it's between academic and PhD student for the win. Give it a couple more seconds. All vote now. And OK, so academics won it, but lots of PhD students on as well, which is great. Perfect. Good to know. And a, and a sprinkling of everyone else. Uh, we're going to keep it to 30 minutes. Uh, so that's feedback we've had from previous webinars. Joe is going to go into turbo mode for such a, a large topic and uh, cover it all off in a matter of minutes. And we've also got a feedback survey at the end, such that you can give us any more feedback that you've got. But without any further ado, I'll hand over to Joe, who's going to kick us off with, is the definition of physical activity too narrow? So we'll get your slide up, Joe. Thanks, Tippy. OK. Um, let's go here. We'll bring this up. I'll click on share. And you should be seeing that now? We can indeed. And if you go full screen on that, that should be good. Great one. OK, let's do this. Thank you for inviting me, Tippi and Rachel. And thanks to ISPAR and ISBN PAR as, uh, for hosting this uh, as well. I'm, I'm honoured to be, to be speaking with you. And hello to everybody wherever you are around the world. Um, let me get straight into it. I'm interested in, in the concepts we use in policy in general, and today specifically in physical activity policy. And I want to offer an argument, and I want to inspire some agreement with me, but perhaps provoke some friendly disagreement about how we define physical activity. Now you can see I've laid my cards on the table right at the start. Do I think the definition of physical activity is too narrow? Yes, I do. And I'm going to explain why. So a, a couple of context slides, and then we're going to get into the, into the meat of uh, the, the, the argument that I'm going to offer. Definitions are important for a variety of reasons. Um, all definitions include and exclude facts and ideas. By their very nature, they, they say what's included and what's not included. As a result of this, they do inform policy. So you can imagine for most or all social issues, there would be thresholds for policy intervention, whether it's the definition of poverty, definition of hypertension, 
or obesity at a population level? What are the thresholds for intervention? And you know, that's to do with how we define those social issues. Now, what interests me as well is that there is, I don't think there's any one perfect definition for a lot of these uh, social problems, social issues. You can see just recently, uh, Tremblay, uh, there was quite a big project on sedentary behavior and this research network identified at least 12 definitions of sedentary behavior. Now, consider this recent study by Ferro, 2018. They identified 102 definitions of epidemiology. One interesting thing is um, those researchers suggested that definitions were evolving over time. And so perhaps it, it's just a chance for me to suggest, well, maybe that's okay. Maybe definitions can and should change over time. So let's get into the, what I call the uh, predominant uh, and certainly dominant uh, definition of physical activity. And it comes all the way back from 1985 from Casperson, Powell and Christensen. And they define physical activity as any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. And perhaps this is a good chance for a tippy to introduce a, a poll question. Okay, so is the Kasperson's 1985 definition too narrow? And I don't think anyone else can see the results, but we can see them coming through live. And it's, uh, it's tight, so get your votes in. Good one. Okay, so there might be some controversy here, some some friendly disagreement. Yeah, I'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, so we've got 36 through. Hopefully you can see those results. Okay, good one. So it, interesting. Um, we'll, we'll, we might try and persuade some of you to, to change your minds as, as we uh, go on through this talk. So, I mean, this dominates undoubtedly. It, it, it's it's very well cited. Um, it's in a variety of policy documents from that now famous you know, U.S. Surgeon General report from 1996. Uh, you've got a who's who of academics, uh, Biddle, Nutri, Hardman, Stencil have all employed this definition. The World Health Organization is used in their policy. The British Medical Journal and amazingly, even Wikipedia. It defines physical activity using this definition. And, and I, I do say it's similar uh, to a lot of these references. There, there is some, some small detail changes, but um, overall the idea is, is that it's about uh, skeletal muscles producing bodily movement, which uh, you know, results in energy expenditure. So there, there's some small wording changes, but uh, uh, those are the other main themes. So, I argue, um, if we can click the next one here, here we go. I argue that, that this definition only includes, and I hope you agree with me here, that it only includes anatomical and physiological aspects of physical activity. So skeletal muscles and resulting in energy expenditure. Interestingly, Kasperson uh, in the article does go on to discussing in great detail about how the energy is measured. So it's about kilojoules, measuring kilojoules. And so it's a very specific way of thinking about writing about physical activity. So I ask, can we or should we create an expanded definition? And a, a, a bit more context but before I, I offer my argument for, for why um, a new definition will be useful is, Examining Kasperson's motivation all the way back in 1985, about 34 years ago, what was, what was the motivation? Well, the, the focus of the article was on epidemiology. Um, so the prevention of disease, promotion of health, and valuable, worthwhile, undoubtedly. I do argue, and this is my point in the bullet point here, that there are clearly now many disciplines outside of epidemiology, outside of health promotion, which are implicated and involved in 
physical activity. And I think that's important. Now, secondly, and also importantly, Kasperson, back in 1985, the specific focus of their article was to distinguish between physical activity, exercise, and fitness as an interpretational framework for comparing studies. So again, the, the purpose of that definition was quite specific. And I do ask rhetorically here, was or would that definition have been intended for, for example, for policy statements? And I do think perhaps not. I, I do argue that as a result of this quite narrow definition focusing on the anatomy and on physiology, that there's no space to capture what physical activity means in a holistic sense. And we're going to go into this in a bit more detail now. Because I think there, there is a, a, a good argument to create a more inclusive definition. So I think we should expand the definition and be more inclusive as well. And you might be wondering if you're focused on, on muscles moving and kilojoules, well, you might be thinking, well, that's all there is to it. That's all physical activity is. Well, let's have a look at what a lot of literature suggests that is also involved in physical activity. And I argue this, I argue that physical activity is inherently a number of things. I argue it's inherently cerebral that the human mind, the brain is, is, is you know, a, a vital part component of physical activity. When we think about physical activity, it, it, we often think about emotion, struggle, pain, joy, the list goes on. We know, don't we, that there's a whole host of psychological theories focusing on physical activity. Nudging theory, the combi theory, all sorts of behavior change theories. They all focus heavily on the human mind, ideas about motivation, for example. And I think you might agree with me that since the 1985 definition does not include anything about effect or, or emotion or cognition, that there is certainly opportunity to bring that into a more inclusive definition. For some reason, it's not mentioned at all. I argue that physical activity is inherently social and the literature does support this, that, that ideas about uh, connection, communion, and product, productivity, uh, uh, creative uh, uh, movements with other people is an inherent uh, part of physical activity. Now, you might say, Joe, but what about if I go for a run by myself or a hike in the mountains without anybody else? Okay, we can discuss that uh, later on. But certainly, for most people, the vast majority of the time, Physical activity is, a social, is inherently a social act. I argue it's inherently situated. So both physically situated in specific spaces and culturally situated. And the literature supports this as well. Now we know that, that and certainly I, I believe that it, it not just uh, physical activity doesn't just take place in, in situated spaces that by being physically active in particular spaces, we change how space is used. So there is a symbiotic relationship between human movement and space. Now, I argue it's also, physical activity is also political, um, that rules and values of a society shape what is appropriate or what's inappropriate activity in, in spaces. And it just to provide a quick example here's a, a photo I took in a uh, on a, a street in in Rome in Italy and here's some young people doing break dancing with a, a, a looming advertisement above them now I would say yes you could talk about muscles skeletal muscles and kilojoules but I hope you can appreciate that physical activity is in this and any social setting is is a lot more than just about muscles and kilojoules. So to provide a bit more evidence, I offer this, and this is a, um, an article from the World Health Organization uh, just last year, Rutter uh, and, and, and co colleagues. 
talk about the, what are the drivers of physical activity? And here it is, a systems map. And this systems thinking, ecological thinking is becoming a lot more popular now in uh, uh, policy and, and research about physical activity. I think it's a fantastic map. It does highlight the, the complexity of, of what drives physical activity. Now, I argue, again, that this argument, by thinking about the systems of physical activity, physical activity is produced by much more than skeletal muscles. Yes, muscles are important, but so is this wider system, this wider sphere of, of influence. And I'm sure you, you can see, uh, you can uh, get that link to that article and a really interesting article about thinking about the systems which inform and affect physical activity. And so here I go, here I offer a proposal for another definition and, and see what you think about this one. This was published in uh, my book earlier uh, this year called The Politics of physical activity. And here is the definition. I define physical activity as involving people moving, acting and performing within culturally specific spaces and contexts and influenced by a unique array of interests, emotions, ideas, instructions and relationships. Now, I'm the first to admit that there is a lot going on in that definition. And I welcome agreement. I, I welcome critique as well. But I hope uh, viewers can a, a appreciate that the rationale for creating, moving beyond uh, the traditional definition. And there's, I think there's a, a few positive aspects of offering and, and, and changing how we think about physical activity. You'll see that I prioritize uh, the idea of people moving, the concept of movement of people through space over muscles moving. Uh, so I think that can change by changing the definition, it might change how we think about uh, physical activity. I've tried to emphasize the holistic nature of what physical activity is. So I try to emphasize complexity, the, uh, the environment, bringing the environment into play, and the human experience as well. Because I think we, we omit too much when we just talk about bodily movement of skeletal muscles uh, as you know, um, with energy expenditure. I think we need to emphasize the complexity of it in our definitions, take into account the environment and the human experience. Now, I don't want to get too philosophical, but my third point here about questioning uh, the duality or dualism um, of the original definition is important. I think there's an opportunity to move beyond thinking about physical activity, um, you know, thinking about the body as a machine or in a very mechanistic mindset and by thinking about instead the body is as our self and self and so by by changing the definition we can change how we think about what physical activity is i think it will open up new ways of talking about activity and beyond that i think there's certainly opportunity to even reframe interventions particularly those which are heavily influenced or perhaps exclusively influenced about um, you know, decreasing risk of disease. Of course, it's incredibly important to do that, but perhaps there's an opportunity to bring more uh, ideas into that conversation. And, and certainly I must say, even though the, the, global, the recent global strategy on physical activity published by the World Health Organization is, uses Casperson's original definition, it, it certainly does uh, uh, include a, you know, a range of rationalities, a range of motivations for, uh, for promoting physical activity, which is great. So th those are, are, are some of the, uh, uh, I think, benefits of, of changing our definition. And so just to 
try and uh, delineate uh, or contrast and compare the original definition with uh, the one I've, I've offered to you today. I hope you can see that, that there is an opportunity to, to think differently about, about how we write about, how we talk about, and how we think about physical activity. Now, you might be thinking there's an opportunity as well to, oh, you know, we could always include both of these definitions into, into some type of super definition, perhaps. Well, that's possible. Um, and, you know, I, I leave it up to the viewers to certainly create uh, their own definitions. As I say, considering there's been over 100 definitions for epidemiology, perhaps we could be a bit creative with how we uh, talk about physical activity instead of just relying on this one traditional definition. And with that in mind, with that in mind on this next slide, we have, uh, I've invited Tepe, our host of, of uh, this, to offer another definition. This is what he came back to me with. Physical activity is a, any bodily movement involving large muscle groups, maybe pre-planned or opportunistic, occurs in different social, physical, political environments, and driven by individual biological, societal, political, and environmental factors. So, again, a lot going on in that definition. It's a mouthful. But <laughs> it is a mouthful, but, but certainly you're thinking outside of this traditional definition as well. And I think, Tippi, is this a moment that we might have another uh, a poll? Because there's an opportunity, I, I wonder, to be a bit more creative in, in how we define this. It is, yeah. And we've got some really good questions coming through on the Q&A. So if people can keep those firing through and um, discussion in the chat, so that's good. Um, so the next question um, for the poll is, should we have agreement on just the one definition uh, or encourage a variety of definitions? So I can see votes are already coming in. Um, so there's more people voting on this one. That's good. Make sure you get in. Oh, it's like a horse race. <laughs> Just more ethical. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll give it a few more seconds. And all right. Oof, close. Okay, again, a, a great diversity of opinion, which is which is great. Um, and certainly there might be some ongoing arguments and conversations about, you know, whose definition and, and, and what definition uh, is, is used in policy documents and, and, and academia and teaching and, and research. And I'm sure that conversation can, can uh, be continuing. So I think um, here I am at my last slide. And I say here, I say thank you all for listening and viewing. And thank you, Tippy and Rachel, for, for hosting this. And, and I guess uh, to the viewers, I'd say, how, how would you choose to define physical activity? If you had, a, if you had a, a blank piece of paper, a fresh piece of paper, how would you choose to define it? Knowing what you know, what ideas, what concepts would you use? Would you just focus on bodily movement with skeletal muscles, um, you know, um, requiring energy expenditure, or would you go beyond that definition? So thank you very much. And maybe we have some conversation now, Tippy. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Um, I might just uh, take over the slides and sure go back to our screen. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and we indeed have got quite a few questions coming through. So I think I might start with a, a a tougher one for you. Um, so do you think if we did go to a broader definition um, that this would encourage people from outside the physical activity field, maybe broader policymakers, to actually think about physical activity differently? Absolutely, I do. I can't speak on behalf of, of all policymakers, but I think by uh, including uh, concepts and ideas which are, which might speak to these policymakers as opposed to talking about skeletal muscles in a definition. I think there's only opportunity now. Now I will I will be as humble as possible when I say that 
you know, um, the definition that I offered and certainly your definition, Tippy, as well, that there is a lot going on in there. But um, if anything, that simply shows that there's there's opportunity for others as well to create perhaps perhaps even shorter, sharper, even more persuasive definitions than we've offered. So perhaps that's a challenge uh, for our viewers uh, and certainly people who are writing policy on this. There, there is a good opportunity to, to, like I say, move just beyond this traditional definition, which had a, had a very specific idea behind it, and I, which I don't think was necessarily intended for policy. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough, and I think that probably relates to another question here with um, from uh, Maria. So we've got: uh, Do we need to revise to just one definition, or have one that's more physiological uh, that is possible to measure, and then one that's more holistic, um, probably more like the one you've put up? Yeah, I do appreciate that, and and I think in different disciplines, you know, different. Uh, people in different disciplines will probably rely or prioritize uh, definitions which perhaps suit them. And I understand that, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're working in a lab, uh, measuring uh, kilojoules of, you know, energy expenditure through muscles, uh, you know, of course you'd, you'd probably want to emphasize that definition. Um, but again, that's a very specific space. So I think different disciplines, whether you're in, uh, education or health or transport, uh, the list goes on, sport and leisure, there, there's opportunity to, to, I think, be more creative in how we, how we talk about it. But, but look, I, I, I don't think I would argue to um, you know, remove this original definition. I, I think, it, if anything, it, it, it simply uh, adds to the context and it, 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 you know, it does provide a one way of, of looking at it, very specific way, um, which probably isn't suitable for, for everybody in every different discipline. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we have one, uh, a question that's um, been asked relating to actually the Casperson definition, just giving a critique of that. And I think I've seen this um, kind of critique before. So what about isometric contractions? which are still, um, and so the Casperson definitions, which includes the movement, um, wouldn't include necessarily the uh, a uh, flat yeah. for instance. Uh, ab absolutely, and, and those who are more, more anatomically and physically inclined will be able to provide more expertise on that. But the idea of, of, a, uh, of a contraction, which is static, which is, so you're not moving, but you are certainly uh, expending energy, um, you, you, you uh, happy to discuss that one. Um, now, for those of uh, you who, uh, viewers who are also, it makes me think of, of this point, that uh, the Kisperson definition talks about skeletal muscle. Um, so it, I assume that it, it means it excludes cardiac muscle. Now, uh, you know, uh, perhaps that's a different argument, but I, I think just an interesting little aspect of the definition which, or which you could critique as well. Yeah. Um, so, okay, uh, last couple of minutes, because um, we will wrap up bang on time. Um, so there's a, a, a statement here that's been upvoted by quite a number of people, um, so offers a, a different view, but I thought it'd be helpful to bring it up and see your yep. thoughts on this, Joe. So, so although several aspects um, of things influence physical activity, as per the diagram you put up um, from Rutter and colleagues, is physical activity in the end just the movement itself and does the traditional definition uh it doesn't exclude the underlying determinants um but rather it keep it keeps the definition of physical activity very clear uh and gives a, an end to the definition now isn't clarity wonderful we all aim for clarity in our lives now i would argue that physical activity is an incredibly complex phenomenon so so by searching and seeking for as much clarity as possible that that can be uh beneficial you know if, especially if you're writing a, a research article or a research grant clarity can be wonderful but 
we sh should really think about what we miss out when we are as clear and perhaps going back to the title of this talk, as narrow as possible. What do we omit? What do we miss out? And as a result, what possibilities of talking about, thinking about physical activity, what are, what are, uh, are removed from our thought process, processes as a result? Now, I, I, I appreciate people will, will want to hang on tightly to the Caspersen definition for simply that reason. It provides a great amount of clarity. We don't need to think about anything else if we just think about, you know, muscle move, muscles moving and, and you know, kilojoules being spent. But, but uh, you know, I would argue there's a, there's a big wide world out there and there's, there's an opportunity to, to think a bit more broadly, holistically, and, um, and, you know, and, and um, in a more complex fashion. Brilliant. Thank you, Joel. Um, so we have reached half a uh, or half a hour time. Um, so at the end. Um, so thank you very much. Um, obviously, I think some of these conversations are going to continue. Um, you're on social media. They can um, tweet you and you can have little mini conversations. I think that would be great to continue that. Um, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to keep the conversation going about this. Brilliant. Um, I, I, yeah. And, and thank you guys for, for hosting and, and thank you all the the viewers for for being here. Um, so I might just wrap it up by saying, uh, for those that don't know, uh, there is a new ISPAR website. And in the ISPAR website, you will be able to find all of our webinars uh, in some way, shape or form, either under the free webinars, which you do not have to be an ISPAR member to view. Um, and that will be this one. So we'll make that uh, free. But we are going to start putting some into the members only area, so into the sign in area. Uh, so make sure you join and become a member. Uh, very easy to do so and a number of benefits for joining. Our next webinar is a joint one hosted with Isbun Bar, uh, looking at career pathways. Um, so a really interesting one um, to look forward to there. Um, and it does have the, the diet side involved in that one as well um, and nutrition. So thank you very much, Joe. Uh, for the participants who have uh, stayed with us, there is a quick survey that would be great. As soon as we click end, it would be great if you could just help us out and fill that out. If you've got any ideas of topics, do send those through to isparearlycareer at gmail.com. Uh, and once again, thanks, Joe, for uh, that great webinar. Thank you, guys. Good to see you. Thanks.